Now. Right, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to Preston City Council's virtual overview and scrutiny management committee meeting. This meeting is being webcast and is available to view live. Before we continue with the agenda, I will ask the scrutiny support manager, Jackie Pollock, to confirm who is in attendance, please. Thank you, Chair. We forgot yourself. Uh, I'm Councillor Whittam, the Vice Chair, Councillor Potter, Councillors Atkins, Borrow, Henshaw, Zach Senna, Woolham, and Councillor Wallington for interview officers, myself, Jackie Pollock, and Jackie Wilding. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie, for that. Uh, before we start, I'd like to confirm a few housekeeping arrangements. Please, can all attendees remain muted until invited to speak? And please keep your mobile phones on silence or switched off to avoid disruption when you are speaking. And please remember that we are broadcasting live. And also those with landlines, please can you make sure they're, they're lifted off as well, please. First item on the agenda is Chair's announcement. So I'd like to welcome you all to the meeting, that's the first thing. And also to advise that depending on the length of this meeting, we may have a short comfort break. We're also expecting the Chief Executive, Mr Phillips, to join us at this meeting this morning. But he's got another meeting at this moment, so he's likely to join around about 11 o'clock. And hopefully at some stage this morning, we'll be able to get an, an update on the COVID-19 situation. Um, obviously, there's a lot happening in Preston at the moment, and there's a lot been happening in the Preston media over the last week. So I'm hoping that we will be able to cover a number of these subjects today. But unfortunately, some issues may have go below the line. So I uh, will move on. Um, are there any substitute members, please, Jackie? Um, yes, Chair, we've got uh, Councillor Borrow for Councillor Brute. Oh, OK, thank you. And welcome, Councillor Borrow. Uh, the next item are declarations of interest. Um, has anybody got any declarations of interest to be made? If you have, just put DOI in the chat. Uh, and then Jackie, who is the scrutiny support manager, will invite you to speak. I'll just give you a second or two to see if anybody has the DOI. There doesn't appear to be, uh, but if anybody does have an item of interest during the meeting, you can still put your DOI in then and that can be confirmed. OK, thank you. Item four are the minutes of the meeting on the 19th of June 2020. Is everybody happy with the minutes and can we agree them, please? And if somebody would like to volunteer to second the minutes, that would be great. Thank you. I'll second the minutes too, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Warren. Right, can I remind everybody that if you wish to speak on any item under discussion, that you need to use the instant messaging facility by typing RTS for request to speak. So thank you for that. Um, item five, can I ask if there are any decisions to be taken in accordance with the party political whip? If so, can we declare those now? It's highly unlikely, I think, but we just, I'll just give you a few seconds. I don't, I don't think there's nothing coming up in the chat, so I think everything's fine on that. And item six, can I ask you, Jackie, has there been any call-ins since the last meeting? Um, no, there hasn't, Chair. And also, can I just ask, Chair, that um, Councillors Corker and Mian have joined the meeting? Oh, Thank you very much. Morning, Councillors Corker and Mian, and welcome to the meeting. Thank you. Now, item seven is our interview with our Cabinet Member. And uh, this month, we've got Councillor Martin Rawlinson, who's the Cabinet Member for Resources. And he will update us on his portfolio and answer any questions we may have. Again, I can I just remind you to use the RTS if you wish to ask a question to Councillor Rawlinson. Welcome, Martin. Good morning. How are you? Hello. Hiya, Martin. Welcome to the meeting. Um, I think we usually, the usual procedure is that we ask you to just give an update of where you're up to up with matters concerning your portfolio and then give the opportunity for uh, members to ask questions. I am conscious that there might be some items that may have to go below the line. So if you do get questions, I'm sure this scrutiny manager will advise us uh, if those those items, those questions can't be answered. Also, Councillor Potter as Vice Chair, can you keep an eye on the chat with me just in case I miss a number of uh, requests and questions coming through, please? Thank you. So welcome, Councillor Rawlinson. If you 
want to make a start by updating us on your portfolio and where you're up to with everything. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, the Council's financial outturn report has just been published for Cabinet next week. Um, normally, I think we would be discussing that in detail, but um, it's probably a little bit late, but um, it's not a big story, is it? So I'll talk about that a little bit and then I'll go on to COVID-19 finances because obviously that's one of the, that's the biggest story, but it's not the only big story at the moment. Um, so the outturn report is out, it does show uh, an underspend, which is uh, welcome, which is down to um, efficient management of departmental budgets in the main. There is large slippage, which has become the norm and um, it's will be carried forward and spent uh, in the coming year, of course. A uh, quarter of a million to go into reserves. The capital budget is um, just about balanced. Uh, again, lots of slippage as usual. Um, the the outer report doesn't really tell us any of the COVID-19 story because obviously lockdown hit. Uh, just before um, the end of the financial year. So um, it's it's all about last year, really. Um, it was uh, another very well managed year in terms of the council's finances. We, we're still spending more than we've got. We know that, but we do have um, ample reserves to manage that issue at the moment. We continue to look for efficiencies. The, uh, the council is effectively constantly restructuring um, when when someone leaves or retires. Um, it, it's looked at whether we can uh, restructure and make a saving. Uh, it does affect the capacity of the council to deliver, absolutely, but uh, we haven't really stopped delivering uh, any services. Um, despite the financial pressures. And so it's it's a very good report and it's and it's worth going through despite the, the fact that it's not the big story. Of course the big story is COVID-19 and um, we've all been dealing with that since March. And I'll give you some facts and figures on the council finances as regards to COVID-19. Government gave us 1.8 million government grants towards the financial impact. Um, with that, we set up the community hub, which is uh, mainly about food distribution, not entirely, but other things too. But um, there's been an awful lot of support for community groups who've been distributing food to people, isolating uh, vulnerable people. Uh, there's been new groups sprung up because of COVID-19. We've been supporting them to uh, massive numbers uh, of groups uh, doing voluntary work. And it, it, it's worked really well. Uh, I think uh, Naveeda would tell you uh, a lot more about that. Uh, I'm sure you've heard about it anyway. Uh, we got um, money for providing emergency accommodation for the homeless to get them off the streets during COVID and there's been an operation to try and get as many of them as possible into permanent accommodation and not go back on the streets. So that's that's really good, that's ongoing. Uh, the, we use the money towards the cost of PPE and other health and safety measures. Uh, waste collection costs increased during lockdown, strangely. Uh, I think with everybody in the house, we just produced more household waste. Um, and there was costs of making the town hall safe and other buildings, of course, where people are still working, although vast amount of people working at home and that's been facilitated by IT really quickly and really efficiently. <coughs> Government said they would compensate us for lost fees and charges um, like uh, car parking can income from hires on parks, cafe income, uh, licensing, 
planning and application fee income, license fee income, but not commercial income, which is the big one for us, of course. Uh, although car parking income is pretty big, but um, for our finances, but um, the commercial rents uh, are two million a year net. So um, that's a, that's a concern for us going forward, obviously. The um, government also gave councils a very big job to do, giving out grants to businesses. We've processed uh, over two and a half thousand applications. We've received three and a half thousand and paid out uh, over 30 million. We've also granted 29 million in business rate relief. Uh, that, that, was a, that was a massive job which the um, department did really well. Uh, they, they pulled in resources, they worked all the time and um, lots of businesses that paid to work were not up to date in terms of business rates and other things. So it, it was a very big job and anyone who's not been paid yet, it's down to issues with the paperwork and they, they may have outstanding issues with the valuation office, things like that. Uh, there have been, there's been some quite difficult ones because the government put the onus on councils to make sure there was no fraud, any fraud will fall back on us. So we, we had to be careful. I believe um, over 90% of the money has been paid out across the country, including us. Um, but we seem to be slightly behind at one point on the payouts, but um, we, we caught up and uh, it, may, it may have been down to late applications, it may have been down to just us being more careful than a few others, I don't know, but um, it, it, they've done a really good job in the end. It's, it's, um, and, and hopefully a lot of these businesses will survive because of it. Uh, council tax and business rate collection is going to be a concern going forward. Um, it was uh, down a little bit last year already, so uh, on council tax. Um, obviously business rates go to the government and then some of them come back. So that that, that impact will be uh, spread out a little bit, but um, it will hit us. Uh, unemployment's rocketing, which suggests that, uh, well, businesses are shedding jobs and going under, uh, and that means less business rates. Just bear with me, I'm just going through this information, see what's the most relevant for you. We, we granted a three month rent free period for city centre tenants and the market hall tenants because obviously the business just uh, plummeted. Some of them stayed open and stayed fairly busy, we know that, but uh, we certainly need them to do that, they adapted really well. Um, if, if these businesses go, if our tenants go under, then we're getting no rent at all. So a, a three months, around three period, seemed like a no-brainer tool to hope, hope you'll agree with that. Uh, rent relief and rent holidays are being offered on an individual basis for those who can evidence they've been financially impacted. So all our tenants can ask for help not the city centre ones. Um, um, we have been approached by a few businesses uh, who haven't had much help in, in our properties and we're looking at those. Um, yeah, I mean the, the whole the whole of council resources has just turned towards COVID-19 across, across the board. Uh, almost everyone has been pulled in and, and working on that. So it, it's been a, an incredible time and, and the staff, as usual, have been incredible uh, and delivered so much while continuing to keep um, regular services ticking over as well. So um, we, we certainly need to, to do something to recognise that at some point, but of course it, it, it's ongoing at the moment. Um, there is another I won't go into detail because it's below the line, but there is a report on discretionary grants. This was a grant spot to help businesses who didn't qualify for grants in the original scheme. 
and I'm sure you've seen the report and you might want to discuss it below the line in a little while. Uh, but again, the officers have come up with a really good scheme. Um, it, it's, uh, I'll take no credit for it. The officers uh, have put that uh, system together to try and be as fair as possible and spread the money out as early as possible to keep as many businesses going as possible and I'm really happy with it. So yeah, uh, that's me for now. Thank you very much Martin and thank you very much for that update. You're, you're absolutely right, I mean COVID-19 has just taken over everything since, since March and, um, and I'd also like to say yes, our, our staff have been absolute stars, they are the major asset uh, of our, our council and they've just been absolutely brilliant and just all pulled together. Um, I have a number of questions, people indicating that they wish to ask us questions. So the first one on my list is Jonathan. So, Councillor Saxena, do you want to ask your question, please? Uh, thank you, Chairman. A couple of uh, things to ask. First of all, did you mention that um, the lockdown only came the very tail end of the financial year? But I do recall from all these things um, that um, the external auditors expected us to, to make some uh, re reference to COVID-19 in the annual governance statement. Uh, and of course, ratified the fact that any new read the annual governance statement and its draft form has had more than half a page about what was going on in COVID-19. So we certainly applied to that today. That was very true thinking by the whoever compiled this. Um, the second thing, you did talk about um, businesses not being very up to date and uh, it's causing certain problems. There's a slight silver lining there, and then as a result of this, they can make the neighbourhood of their books up to date and they'll probably operate better in the future. Thank you. Yes, um, on, the, on the second point first, it, it really has uh, been an eye opener um, because um, we've learned a lot about businesses in Preston because of this exercise and it could well fall, you know, board well for the future in terms of our databases and our you know information on what's going on in Preston. So uh, absolutely that, that that is a silver lining. Um, yeah with on the audit side everything now with, with the financial procedure rules everything has to be reported in year. So any any finances relating to COVID the COVID nineteen that did um, uh, take place, money received, money that went out on COVID has to be reported in that financial year. So it does get mentioned in some reports, but uh, it was only for a few weeks. Thanks. Thank you, Martin. Is that answer? If you've got any more questions, Jonathan, or does that answer no, your that, question? That, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, the next person on my list is Ron. Councillor Ron Wollen, please. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Um, yeah, actually, Martin has answered a couple of my questions already, but um, just a, a few questions regarding the SMEs in Preston. And uh, you've updated us on uh, obviously how things are going with the payment of grants. Um, could you just uh, advise um, how the administration of the grants is going, and um, you know how many companies do you feel have not actually uh, Claim the grants in, in the local area. Yeah, um, the admin's gone really well. Um, anyone that we could contact, we contacted. Um, if, if we just didn't have contact detail, then, then we struggled. Uh, and there are businesses that haven't applied. Uh, and they, they may have their own reasons for that. I don't have a figure. I don't know if Jackie has got a a figure on that, but um, as, I, as I said, the administration of it uh, I thought was superb and we do have to be careful. Uh, there's been rumours and stories about people claiming multiple grants and that they're exactly that, the rumours and stories, the, the officers have been really careful. I mean, I'd be amazed if something doesn't come to light where someone's claimed and they shouldn't have done and we paid it, but we, we, we we try to be very careful. There are um, there have been applications from businesses who technically on paper are businesses, 
but they're barely trading. They've barely traded for a couple of years. So that, that's been tricky. Um, but I know that we, we've paid one or two of them out because on paper, they, under the rules, they qualify. So it, it's been a really difficult exercise and it's been implemented really well by the officers. And I, I don't know if, you, if you've had requests from local businesses that you've had to uh, send to the officers. I've had loads. Uh, and they've been really good at, at chasing them up. Um, so yeah, I don't know if Jackie's got any figures on uh, perhaps businesses that haven't applied. Yeah, Jackie, do you want to come in on this one? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, um, I've just checked it now. Uh, there's only 200 businesses who haven't applied. Now we know some were eligible, but when um, because of the size of the business um, because it's situated in quite a number of um, areas that if they would have applied they would have been subject to state aid so we are aware that there are a number who haven't applied because they would have met the state aid implications so we have only 200 who haven't applied out of uh, probably about over 2600 who were eligible to apply. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you for that. Ron, have you got some more questions? Uh, thank you. Yes, thank you, Sue. Um, and thank you, Martin, for that. Um, obviously, I appreciate officers that have done a tremendous job um, so far in the administration of the grants and um, very difficult circumstances. So uh, uh, dealt with it in an extremely efficient way. But um, I'm uh, Martin mentioned a little bit earlier about um, the number of key areas where there'll be lost income for the council. And uh, as an example, loss of car, car parking revenue, uh, cultural income, and uh, to mention a few of which. And um, you've also answered the question that government will be um, compensating you for um, a lot of the lost income from that. Um, but I just wondered, um, you mentioned that you're having an a, um, emergency budget, I believe, sometime in October. Uh, can you give us a flavour of what you feel uh, will be contained in that budget in, in October, please? At this day, I haven't ruled out an emergency budget, and I still haven't ruled it out. But um, because the hour turned late, and uh, they've been working on that and the statement of accounts. I still don't really have a full picture of where we stand and whether we need to do anything uh, really quickly and whether there's anything viable that we can do quickly to, to help the situation and, and really just what the situation is. So, uh, unfortunately, I can't really answer your question just now, but hopefully, over the next few weeks, I will be able to. Okay. Um, Thank you, Martin, for that. Um, a good couple of questions in relation specifically to COVID. Um, I don't know, Chair, whether you want me to uh, cover those now or at a later point. Uh, if you want, Ron, I'll come back to you in a minute because I've got another few people wanting to okay. ask questions. So I'll come back to you on the COVID questions. Are they relating, obviously, to Martin's portfolio and COVID? Is that right? Yeah. Uh, no, specifically, specifically about the uh, what, what we're doing with COVID in the Preston area at the moment. But it might be something for Adrian, possibly. In the yeah, uh, could, yeah thank, thank you for that, Ron. Uh, I can see that the Chief Exec has joined the meeting, so we'll stick to Martin's portfolio at the moment, and I will bring in Jennifer next. Kathleen, do you want to ask a question? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I want to add my thanks to the staff as well because I think they have absolutely been tremendous. And we know that, like all other local authorities, staffing numbers have been cut repeatedly year on year because of the um, austerity. So I think it's absolutely fantastic that they've stepped up the way they have. Not unexpected, knowing quite a number of them themselves, but yeah, I, I just want to record thanks for that. Um, Martin, you mentioned that. We've got £1.8 million in grants, I think, to cover expenses that um, occurred during COVID, but those grants cannot be used to cover commercial um, income losses. And I know you've said quite rightly that we gave um, a three month rent free period to um, the market traders in particular, but I wondered if you had any idea of how much 
it's likely to cost uh, the council going forward uh, in lost commercial rents and you know where where we're going to be able to um, recover the money. It's one of the big questions, isn't it? Um, it? It's impossible to know just now because I think it, it's becoming apparent that a lot of businesses uh, furloughed their staff. Um, the furlough scheme is coming to an end, and uh, some companies uh, are shedding jobs uh, well, by the shed load. Um, so I, I did say uh, to a journalist a couple of months ago, I said, I think the effect will be delayed. And it has been, and now it's starting to, to really impact the incentive uh, of keeping staff on to get a thousand pounds in January. I don't think it will work uh, very well at all. So uh, from from now uh, onwards to the end of the year, and maybe in the new year, uh, that's when we'll, we'll start to see uh, businesses reducing and disappearing, uh, and we probably won't have a clear picture of how it will impact our commercial rents and business rates until um, next year, unfortunately. Uh, but obviously we're going to monitor it and try and prepare for it as much as we can. Jennifer, does that answer your question and have you got any more questions? Thank you. No, that's fine, Sue. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. The next person on my list, I've got John. Councillor John Potter. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Martin. Um, I've got a couple of questions. The first one on COVID. So, I mean, the government, when the COVID crisis starts, said it would allow council to do whatever it takes. Do you have faith that actually the government will compensate us to match that um, that statement they put out at the start? Thank you. They, they, they don't appear to be matching that statement, although it's difficult for us um, to comment on that because the initial amount we got has probably covered our um, one-off costs at the moment, but it's it's the ongoing impact that is the real concern, and that certainly won't cover the ongoing impact. Um, and the the officers and the staff have gone into this not worrying about the cost. They've, they've done whatever needs doing. Uh, to make sure everyone's got what they need while they're isolating uh, food and medicine and obviously shelter for the homeless and they, they, they've, they've gone into it not worrying about the bottom line which is quite right of course so um, as as the figures start to get you know um, more defined then we can see exactly um, what the impact is on us but it, it's very clear from all the councils um, especially uh, councils with responsibility for social care and, and things like that, that they, they haven't been given enough money. Um, but uh, it, it's going to be a longer term issue for us, I think. Thank you. Should I just keep going, Sue? Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely fine, John. Thank you. Um, so I'm um, reading through your document. I, mean, I, I acknowledge the fact that um, I appreciate the fact that we only got this yesterday. Um, one of the um, sentences in the document talks about the ultimate aim of the council is to bridge the gap between uh, the money we spend and the money the council receives. Now, you've obviously argued for a very long time about the effects of austerity and and all the other financial pressures put on the council, but over the course of the nine years I think you have been portfolio holder, we haven't really come close to bridging that gap on a year. We have been overspending by up to and sometimes over a million pounds a year. So what could you see happening in the future that thinks that's going to bridge such a large gap? Well, one of the other big stories, of course, at the moment is potential local government reorganisation. So the, there appears to be at least a 50-50 chance at this point that Preston Council won't exist in a few years. So it may be a, a moot point that you make it, but um, the point that you're making is a valid one that we, we've never really balanced the budget because even when we balance the 40 year forecast, we know that we're, we're living off 
balances in reserve. And, and that, that's been a deliberate policy because we've never wanted to make uh, cuts and reduce services and jobs before we have to. That, that's deliberate, uh, as you know. Um, the ongoing work on IT, on uh, service transformation, on restructuring, um, on um, the asset base, on increasing income from the asset base are going to be uh, significant factors in uh, trying to balance the books if, if Preston Council exists that long. Um, if, if we, if we don't appear that we're going to get to the end of the current forecast by the looks of it, but of course, <laughs> who knows really, but um, if, if we do, then those, those three things will, will play a big part, but, but may not be enough to do it. And it, and it, will, and it will almost certainly mean service cuts, which, um, you know, and some, some non-statutory services could well disappear or, uh, or be badly cut if, if we get that far. But um, at the moment, um, I certainly wouldn't want to make severe cuts and, and try and balance the long-term forecast when we, we may not even exist. You've kind of uh, stolen the march on what the next question is going to be, and I know we can't really do much second guessing about the local government organisation, but in, some, uh, in terms of Preston's finances, obviously a large part of our reserves come from the, the Home of England dowry that was left to the city. I mean, we'll obviously want an update from you when the white paper comes out, as much as you can, about what the impact um, of that will be. All those reserves that were given to us just disappear into the ether or go into some government pot. But um, I would like an update from you as soon as we can about that money, um, if that's a little okay with you, Mike. Surely, yeah. I mean, uh, none of us know how it's going to work if it is going to happen. But um, I think in the past, um, when there's been mergers, then um, they tend to, to merge, to, to physically merge the council. So all their assets and all the reserves tend to go into the new council, I believe. But um, who knows, the, the whole new structure, they might just start with a white sheet of paper and a new budget. And, yeah, your assets might go elsewhere, so um, it, it will be interesting. But uh, there, there may be things that we want to try and do before we disappear, if that's the case. And um, there, there's lots of things to look at that people might be concerned about uh, going forward um, in terms of uh, parks and the museum and uh, community wealth building and uh, Preston Guild, even um, this, this Preston Council disappearing, I, I, I feel really affects Preston's identity. Um, so there's quite there's a lot of things to think about if it's going to happen. In the end. Yeah, but we need to keep thinking about it and keep discussing them uh, uh, as we go along. And last one for me, Sue, if that's okay. Yeah, that's absolutely fine, John. So moving uh, on to a slightly other topic, but it was in, in your report on page 18 of the um, President's priorities, is about if, I mean, coronavirus, like you said, is kind of only showing time, town at the moment and dealing with that, but there is another huge impact at the end of the year and that's going to be Brexit. And if it wasn't for COVID, I think the financial impacts and planning for the financial impacts of Brexit would be probably one of the foremost things on, on your mind as a city, uh, as the Council's um, resource uh, cabinet member. Now, on page 18 of the report, uh, I just want a bit of clarity really, because it says uh, the council has made plans in case of a no deal Brexit. These are in line with government guidelines. It then goes on to say the government has now stood down preparations for no deal Brexit. Uh, and then, but the council will continue to follow government guidance. So, I suppose that raises like a kind of simple question. A, is the guidance and guidelines between no deal and a deal the same? What are the differences between those two uh, options in terms of our preparation? And what is, because for me, the likelihood of a no deal Brexit is now probably more likely than any other scenario, because there is no such thing as an oven ready deal if then you're still negotiating like we are. 
So what is your perception of the most likely outcome of the Brexit negotiations at the moment in terms of your planning? It's been it's been pushed to the back of our minds, hasn't it? And obviously, as you say, it's still a major issue. And uh, I'm quite sure the officers are just simply being cautious at this point. So um, even though the government might say um, don't have to prepare for an ordeal at the moment, uh, I think they are continuing with great caution and certainly on investments. Doing that, um, using internal borrowing and uh, using other councils as much as possible. Uh, but in terms of the um, the interpretation of government advice, I would need uh, some help from Jackie on that one. I'm just to maybe just clarify. I'm wondering what the difference interpretation is between. I know Martin, you'll probably be Jackie that will have to answer it. But what what is what is council doing differently? Or a no-deal Brexit to the to a, a deal Brexit that the government seems to think it's going to get. That's the kind of what difference are we doing? I, I don't think we are, but I'll let Jackie uh, come in if, if she can. Uh, yeah, I, I think this is another director. Um, Ali is currently um, they're still attending meetings, but at the moment it, it's just like a watch position, and because. One of the ones who Brexit is, is a no deal is uh, at the current moment. It's unknown how it will affect the uh, council because um, it'll be likely because of the economy. So I think it, it's one that we're just watching it and we've got a director attending meetings to get uh, updates from government. Thank you, Jackie, for that. Yeah, and just sorry, I know I said I, I, that was my last bit. <laughs> That's okay, yeah, carry on, John. You're all right. Thank just just to point that because obviously, how quickly we go through the months now. If we are suddenly going to be on December 31st very, very quickly, and we don't want to be. And, and I, I know, Jackie, you will be doing all your diligence as much as you can, but what we don't want to be seen is being unprepared for what might hit us at the turn of the year. And I, I think probably scrutiny and or the council will need to have a look at what kind of. Brexit, worst case scenario, Brexit kind of plans we have in place as a local authority. Yeah, if I can just just add, it, it is one of the items on the agendas where we're actually co uh, covering the corporate management team, uh, and it has been recently discussed. Um, and I'll bring it. Uh, we'll continue considering it at corporate management team. Thank you, Jackie, for that. Uh, yeah, John, I think that you've made an important point there. I think that's something that does probably need to come to scrutiny as well. Have you got any further questions, John? Or do you want to make any further points? Uh, no, not at this time, Sue. Thank you. OK, thank you very much for that. Thank you all. I haven't got anybody else indicating in the chat that they wish to ask uh, Martin any further questions, but I just wanted to ask you a quick question, Martin. Uh, regarding the ICT strategy, really, I mean, the staff have done, as we know, a fabulous job to get staff, councillors working from home, um, carrying on with meetings like, like we are doing this morning. Um, obviously, going forward, the ICT strategy is going to have to be reviewed, and it's also got cost implications with webcasting and everything else. Have you started to look at this, and have you considered the impact on the budget from these costs? Thank you. I haven't. I believe they've done it within resources at the moment, but ongoing, of course, if going to be more people working at home, which is likely to be, and uh, more equipment needed and more services to be bought in, then, then yes, it, 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 it may well need looking at. Um, you know, the, 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 the webcasting of the meetings is an interesting one in itself because um, it's something that we've struggled to do in the past. And then when this hit, we suddenly find a service that works and we're able to webcast them. Um, and people can join the meetings from anywhere. So it seems like a valuable improvement to you know our democratic processes. And we may well want to continue, even when we can meet, meet up physically, we may well want to continue with some version of that. So there's a lot to think about, as you say. Thank you for that, Martin. Yeah, I think it's what it's demonstrated is how we've all had to adapt and sort of change to the 
completely new way of working. I mean, I think a number of councillors didn't even have iPads or use technology and, and everybody is pulled together with the help of the ICT team as this probably had to pull the hair out training all of us, but it's, it's worked really well and you're right, going forward, there's been so many people interested in the, the meetings, then it's important that we do get more people involved in, in watching or observing our meetings, because that's really good for democracy. Um, I'll just check, I don't think I've got anybody else who wants to ask you a question, Martin, uh, but I know later on we are going below the line on the discussionary grants item that's going to cabinet, Hopefully you can stay um, at the meeting, part of the meeting, if that's OK. Uh, I do understand if you do have to leave. Uh, but thank you very much for, for updating us this morning. Thank you. Thank um, you. Yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. And are you OK to stay, Martin, or are you, do you have to leave? Yeah, no, I'll be here. That's brilliant. Thank, thank you ever so much. Right, if we can move on with the agenda, we're now on to item eight, which is the future interview with Cabinet members. Uh, so this, this schedule was published this week on Wednesday. Um, can we all just uh, agree the draft schedule? We've got Councillor Khan at our next meeting, which will be really timely because we can actually look at everything that's been done in the community regarding food hubs, etc. So are we all happy with the draft schedule? And if not, can you put something into the chat for me, please? Thank you. We don't seem to have anything coming through, Jackie, do we? So I presume that everyone is happy. Any issues, you'll just have to, we'll, we'll discuss them, but thank you. Item nine on our agenda is the cabinet agenda. Now, as far as I'm aware, there's only uh, agenda item 15 for cabinet, which is a below the line item, which we're going to discuss later. Is that correct, Jackie, or has there been any more requests for, for items to, to discuss under that? Thank you. And um, no, there hasn't, Chair. Thank you very much, Jackie. Um, item 10 is the decision making plan. Um, has there been anything brought forward on that, Jackie, please? No, there hasn't, Chair. Thank you. Uh, before we have an update on the task and finish rates, um, I noticed that the Chief Executive has joined the meeting. Um, yes, you have, haven't you? Uh, is, it, is it a particular timely moment? Because I do appreciate that there was a couple of questions from members on general COVID matters. Uh, is it timely for us to ask Adrian, please, to just give us an update on the situation in Preston? Bearing in mind, it's been on the TV this morning uh, with the Director of Public Health, and we're all expecting uh, some kind of changes imminently. I'd appreciate it if you could give us uh, the Scrutiny Committee an update, uh, obviously, for the information that you can share at this present time. If you're there, Adrian, could you just contribute? Thank you. Chair, could I just say we'll, we'll add this as an urgent item because it's not actually on the agenda. Okay, that's absolutely fine. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. I don't think, even though Adrian is there, I don't think for some reason he's been able to speak. I will move on. And then if, if Adrian can speak at some stage, because we do need his input today, uh, then we'll, we will bring him in. Um, Jackie, do you want to be just giving a verbal update on the tasks of finish groups and Crime and Disorder Committee in line with item 11, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, on Tuesday this week, the Crime and Disorder Committee met and they received um, a presentation from Alan, uh, sorry, Alison Hatton regarding the knife crime work plan study. Uh, the presentation was on the Lancashire series firing strategy um, and that will be included in the final study. The, uh, on Wednesday, there was a meeting of the task and finish group. Um, sorry, my mind's complete. Climate change. change. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, yeah, they discussed the way forward and in terms of um, the, the scoping document, they re-examined re it. And I believe that they set up an additional working group. Uh, they'll be carrying out interviews behind the scenes until the next meeting, which will enable the study to progress further. Future 
topics, we I sent an email to all members on Wednesday asking for their votes on what the next two studies should be, and I shall be collating those after the deadline, which is next Friday. If I could just remind everyone to reply when they can. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, I think uh, some of my members have said that there was a voting button, but it didn't seem to be working. So I've just said, uh, just email back with, with the choices. I think, you know, if the vote, if it has a voting button, if it doesn't show up on your iPad or whatever's happening, then it just an email will do, won't it? With just the two choices, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, there is a voting button in terms of you can do it, but I don't know how to do it, so I haven't. I, I know how to do it for yes or no, but not in terms of picking an option. So yes, if everyone could just email the two numbers of the, the ones that they want to choose. Thank you. Uh, I mean, it seems that there's going to be some interesting topics there, so it'll be good if everyone could reply and put their own choices in. And yes, I think sometimes on the iPad, the voting button doesn't work. I don't, I don't know what it is. It's just a strange, strange system, but thank you for that. Thank you for that update. Um, has anybody got any questions on the updates on the task and finish groups, by the way? Has anybody got anything that they'd want to ask Jackie or any of the chairman of the two groups, which um, I think we've got, we've got Carol here, haven't we? And we've also got Jonathan. So has anybody got any questions for Jonathan? Oh, Jonathan, you wish to come in? Absolutely fine. Come in, Jonathan. Thank you. Yeah, the reason why I want to come is not really to report back on the Jonathan for that. Uh, I think it's something that we may need to look at then. So obviously if people are or members are not aware exactly how the crime and disorder committee works it may just be something that we could refresh everybody on or just update to explain how it works. Jackie at one of our scrutiny meetings please and that some information we can cascade out to all members uh, to, you know, so they're aware of how things are. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Carol, did you want to come in on the climate change meeting from the meeting on Wednesday that I had? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes. Um, uh, so as Jackie mentioned, we've got an additional subgroup. We, we haven't really, we've just changed them a little bit to look more at what we can do immediately um, uh, and at a procurement level, especially on the basis that we are looking possibly to become a unitary within a couple of two or three years so yeah we've, we've just sort of changed it a little bit um, for that purpose and also to have a look to see the effect that the pandemic's had um, on, on the way we're operating and everything so yeah it was it, it just had to change just that little bit um, but everybody seems to be happy with the new subgroups the subgroups are a good way of getting covering a lot of ground in a shorter period of time and trying to get sort of nine people all together. Um, so yeah, we are hoping that when we come back to our next meeting in approximately six weeks, that there'll be some more interviews to help us establish the baseline and, and then you know we can look to see what we can do to sort of make a, a, an improvement quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you for that update. Yeah, I think, you know, it is working well in, in the groups and it does, you're correct, we can go out and get on with the work and cover our evidence, I think. So thank you for that update. Um, I'll move on then to item 12, which is membership changes for the task and finish group, if there are any, Jackie. Are there any changes to the groups or has any other member got any changes that they wish to report at this moment? Thank you. I've not been noticed, notified of any, Chair. Thank you. Uh, 
Yeah, and I know there's none from my group. I, I'm not aware of any changes either. So, um, but if we have any, obviously we'll have to report them. Thank you. Uh, moves on nicely to item 13, uh, which is the date of the next meeting, which is 18th of September at 10 a.m., uh, which I'm sure will also be webcast, um, which is the way we are going at the moment. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for your attendance. We are going to go below the line, um, and we've not managed to get a hold of agents, so we'll be going below the line uh, shortly. So, But this is the end of the part A of the agenda where the public are present. So I'd like to thank everybody for attending, but I'd also need to pass this resolution to enable us to go below the line. Um, so it's the exclusion of press and public, and it's that the public be excluded from this meeting during consideration of the following items of business on the grounds that there is likely to be disclosure of exempt information which is described in paragraphs of Schedule 12a to the Local Government Act 1972, which is specified against each heading to each item and that in all circumstances of the case, the public interest in maintaining the exception outweighs the public interest in disclosing it. I wouldn't like to remember that off by heart. Um, but if, if everyone's agreed, we will finish this part A meeting now and we'll go below the line. If anybody disagrees, we'll have to let me know now. And also, if anybody isn't coming back to the part B, as we know we've got to log off now and log back in, uh, then please we indicate in the chat button and then we don't chase you to find out where you are. Anyway, thank you every, everyone for attending and thank you for this morning's meeting and thank you Councillor Robinson for attending as well. Thank you. I think it was finished now, thank you. Sharon, are you there? Right, I suggest we all log out now and log in under party. Okay, thank you.